I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. In this hour, team killers taking a close look. What's going on here? What's going on? I mean, we'll begin with the premise, and any of us who are parents, or maybe all of us because we were all teenagers at some point, we know the teens are tough. They're tough to deal with. You know, at home, they're moody, unpredictable, sometimes antisocial, never want to talk to you, never want to share anything. Um, they're going through a lot of internal changes. It's a very volatile time in, in their lives, and they're trying to figure things out. And, and sometimes things get a little complicated, but at the end of the day, when they end up in our system of justice, things get even a little more difficult because teens are a problem. I mean, they're big enough and old enough to commit very serious crimes, yet we know they're not fully developed. We know that they have a long life potentially ahead of them. And we know there's some level of, of protection that they receive in our system of justice because they're underage, they're teenagers. And in the case of young teenagers, even more protections. So when our system has to deal with extremely violent, extreme behavior involving the taking of human lives, that's where our system sometimes runs into problems. We don't know what to do with them. Well, let's, let's talk about the cases we're talking about tonight. Again, everyone's presumed innocent. But these are the allegations. We begin with Aiden Fucci, accused of stabbing his classmate 114 times. And from everything we know about this case, it seems that it was some sort of a thrill kill. You know, killing for the sake of killing. I'm going to kill someone because I want to kill them. And wow, if, if, the, if those allegations are true, and the evidence turns out to be what prosecutors say it is, and this is someone who's just killing for the sake of killing, what do you do with him? What do you, what do, you do? Is this someone that, all right, we'll give him another chance when he's 50 years old, 40 years old, 30 years old? Like, what happens when you're a young teenager you commit a crime like this. Now, I'm not saying he committed it. He's still presumed innocent. But if you're a young teenager and you commit a crime like this, stabbing someone 114 times for the thrill of it, and then you're thrown behind bars for a decade, two decades, three decades, four decades, what are we going to get society when that person is released? This is serious stuff to, to try to figure out. Let's take a look at the other case, Willard Miller. This one out of Iowa. Not, and, and this was, there's an alleged motive in this one, which was like his GPA. Great point average. Like not doing that well in one class he's struggling with, and that teacher ends up beaten to death with a baseball bat. This, this is not a case where this is something that was like spontaneous crime of passion, fit of rage. The allegation is, is that it was planned, plotted, and executed. What do you do with him if prosecutors prove these charges? Again, like every criminal defendant, presumed innocent. But let's take a, a closer look at this because, you know, when, when you think about this issue with teenagers, and one thing I want to deal with tonight during this, this uh, program is, can you spot someone, a teenager, a young teen, who is capable of killing? Like, are there things that we should be looking for so we can identify them and reach that person before they act out? To me, that's the most significant thing that can, that can come from any case like this. Do we learn something? Do we, do we understand how we can help these kids and protect the others, those potential victims out there? So let's take a look at Willard Miller's 
case and the allegation and the timeline here. Uh, the victim uh, is a woman named Noema Graber, Spanish teacher. Uh, she left the high school and traveled towards uh, Chautauqua Park, 3.59 in the afternoon. 4.42, she parks a car at the park. But then you flash forward to the next day, 8.23 a.m., her ex-husband, Paul, reports her missing because she didn't come home the night before and she didn't show up for work. Officers conducted a search of that park and they located uh, human remains under a tarp, a wheelbarrow, and railroad ties in the northeast side of that park. As I said, beaten to death with a baseball bat. Key break in the case. An associate shows officers, one of the two juveniles in this case that are charged, Snapchat messages uh, that state that uh, Jeremy, one of the, the, the co-defendant, and Willard were involved in Graber's death. The next day, they execute a search warrant on Willard's residence, and they seize his cell phone. So um, the defendant in court today. His mother was there as well. Also, uh, Court TV was there. Let's bring in Court TV's Senior Director of Courtroom Coverage, Grace Wong, joining us tonight by phone in Fairfield, Iowa. Grace, thank you so much. I know it's a long day for you, uh, traveling around the country, covering all these stories for us. Um, I want to start, though, with the victim in this case, the, the Spanish teacher, Noema Graber. I understand that today is actually the, the, the anniversary of her death. Uh, yes, Vinny. Today was the anniversary of her death. Naima um, was a devout Catholic, and uh, there was a group of um, people that went to church with her who uh, walked around the park, and there is a memorial there in the park where she died. Uh, there's a bench that's devoted, that's uh, dedicated to her, as well as um, uh, plants and flowers that have been uh, tender, tended to in her name and so they this a small group about five or six people um stood around and, and prayed and said the rosary because that's what she often did and she went to mass every day and they did this and uh to remember her and to honor her in a way that um they knew that she would have appreciated Okay, so Grace, this is the first time we're, we're covering the story uh, on this program, and I wanted to give the folks at home a little more of the background that you can kind of tell us a little bit of, okay, um, what was going on at that high school? Who is it that investigators and prosecutors allege was involved? And kind of flush out the story for us a little bit. Well, the two people, the two uh, juveniles that um, are involved are Jeremy Goodale, and Willard Chayden Miller. And I say Chayden because in court they often refer to him as Chayden or Chade. It seems to be uh, the name that he goes by instead of his first name. It's uh, his middle name that they use more often. Um, so th these were two teens who are alleged to have um, been struggling in uh, Miss uh, Noina's class, Spanish class. They were in Spanish three, which were which was a more advanced level of Spanish. And um, they didn't like their grade, allegedly, although the motive for this um, hasn't been really talked about. But today we really got more of a sense that that, had, that was the root of it because the prosecution asked uh, uh, Chayden's mother that, about his grades. And she said that he was getting good grades except in her class. So uh, we find out that that indeed could have been the motive, although that hasn't been really explored in any of the hearings that w that have um, taken that have been taking place so far in this case. But the allegation is that they um, knew what she, that she frequented this park every day and uh, watched her. And once they knew that she was going to be alone, they ambushed her and um, you allegedly used a bat to knock her out and, and kill her, and then dragged her body to a place where they hid it under a tarp in a wheelbarrow, as you mentioned earlier. And um, that, so it's, it's, it's kind of shocking that two young people, as young as they are, uh, actually planned this crime. And uh, not, not just K 
carried it out, but then concealed it, went back to where they killed her, dragged her to the northeast part of the park where they hit her, which is quite a distance from where she was allegedly beaten. And do, do we know if they do we know if they went to school the next day um, and sort of were just kind of going about life afterwards? Do we have any idea, any indication yet? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if they went to school the next day. I know that um, the day after she was discovered, uh, he was getting ready to uh, do a driver's ed course, at least uh, um, Chayden was, and that's when police caught up with him, was that very morning that he was supposed to go um, to his driver's ed class. Wow. All right, so everyone was in court today. Tell us about uh, today's hearing, what it was all about. Well, the defense has filed a couple motions, mainly um, uh, a Frank's motion and a suppression motion. They allege that they obtained uh, Chayden's interview uh, where he made some very incriminating statements illegally that he that they basically misled uh, Chayden's mother into thinking that they were interviewing a group of students about Milena's disappearance. And his mother testified uh, in court today telling the judge that she was under the impression that there was more than one student being interviewed, that it was a group of students being interviewed about her disappearance. She did not know at the time that police came to her house that her son was a suspect or that uh, he was going to be interrogated about the homicide. And uh, they uh, asked her to sign a waiver that would give them permission to in interview uh, Chayden. And she said that she was not aware of the nature of this waiver because she didn't have the right glasses. She had uh, she has corrective glasses that help her drive and glasses that help her read. And she had her driving glasses, but not her reading glasses. And so the detective uh, who came to um, take uh, Chayden into custody uh, circled the part where she was supposed to sign and then pushed the paper towards her. So she felt uh, she didn't say it, but it it, it 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 sounded like she felt coerced into signing it, and she couldn't travel with him, even though she had the option. She she traveled independently, so she did not get a chance to speak or see him until much later that day, even though she had asked. And then the other thing that um, was very compelling was that she, when she was when she arrived at the police station where he was being questioned. Uh, she said that she noticed that there weren't other parents there, and she wondered about that. And she called a friend of hers who is a detective in Oregon, and um, she asked, uh, she got advice from her, and that she asked that the interrogation stop. And she said, based on her call log to her friend, she wanted the interrogation to stop at 7.15 that morning. And she said that the police continued to interview him for hours after that. And we heard testimony that the interview lasted about two hours. So um, that those were, you know, that was the, the, the gist of her testimony that, that basically police misled her into thinking that she was cooperating with them when instead they were interrogating her son uh, and getting incriminating information that would lead to a charge of first degree murder against him. Gotcha. So mom's in court today saying I was duped by the police. The defense attorney saying duped by the police. So this evidence should not be used against this defendant. This incriminating evidence that helped investigators get to what they believe is the truth in the case. All right. This sounds absolutely uh, compelling and a lot on the line here. Grace Wong, Court TV Senior Director of Courtroom Coverage from Fairfield, Iowa tonight. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Vinny. All right, folks, uh, as Grace mentioned, one of the defendants, Willard Miller, also known as Chayden, mom was testifying today. Let's take a listen to some of mom's testimony. Did you know when you were given that document that, that Chayden was in custody? No. Ex uh, why do you say no? Do you want the long answer? <laughs> um, what I was told is that all of the students and parents of Noemma Graber were being rounded up to try and figure out what had happened 
why she had disappeared. I understood that all of the students were together and that the parents were there and that they wanted to be able to talk to the students and they needed my permission to be able to talk to the students. So you didn't understand that Chaden was in custody being held at the point in time when you signed that? No, I thought he was in a room with other students. Before you signed that form, were you told that Chaden was a suspect in any crime? No. Before you signed that form, were you told that there had even been a homicide? No. So the question is, is this, is this fair? Is this what um, investigators normally do when you're investigating a juvenile and you've got one of the parents with you? Let's bring in our special guest joining me in Atlanta, Georgia, former special agent in charge from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Trabor Randall with us. Trabor, great to see you tonight. Thanks so much. Um, I know officers don't have to be honest when you're interrogating a suspect, um, but what, was, uh, what were you trained and what did you teach agents when it comes to um, interviewing a juvenile and you're talking to mom or dad trying to get that permission? What, what normally takes place in those circumstances? Well, Vinny, it sounds like uh, in the very beginning, the officers did exactly what they're required to do uh, legally. They obtained consent from mom. I was listening to see if maybe there was a waiver that was signed, and it sounds like there was. That's exactly what we would do in that case, um, because there's a different legal test, if you will, when you're um, talking with a juvenile who is a witness as opposed to a juvenile who's a suspect and you certainly have to get the permission from the parent. It sounds to me that that's exactly what they did in this case. Um, you know, it's not uncommon after the fact, uh, you know, that the child or the, the student or the juvenile discloses something that's gonna cause them some problems, you know, that a parent might say, well, I didn't know this was gonna occur, but I think that they're gonna be okay in this case. And a lot of times now um, that, that um, you know, permission is going to be gained while, you know, officers are recording nowadays just because people have a tendency to go back and say that something else happened. But I, I think that they're going to be okay in this case. They asked for permission, she gave consent, and she even signed a waiver. Now, for her to say, well, I didn't read it. I didn't have on good glasses. You know, a, a judge is going to have to make those decisions. Yeah, that one, that, that part is, sounds a little sketchy. The, the, the part I was most uh, con concerned about was, um, misleading, apparently. Let, let's presume that what she's saying and testified to today is 100% true. That they were saying, listen, we're just talking to a bunch of students. Didn't mention that he was a suspect. Didn't mention that he was the only one that they were interviewing. Do you think they have an obligation to let that parent know, regardless of what's written on the paper, when you're having that kind of discussion and, and you're talking to the parent? Again, haven't been in that same situation where you're trying to sort things out and, and figure things out. Um, I could hear them saying, you know, we're simply, we're talking at the kids trying to find out what's going on, you know, find out, you know, what may have happened. She's disappeared. We're gonna be talking with, you know, several people. They didn't indicate that it was gonna be a kind of a sit down group session. I didn't hear that. What I hear is that she understood or made the assumption, well, they're talking with other kids you know, maybe they're going to be together. It doesn't sound like she asked any clarifying questions about that. Um, again, I don't see anything wrong at this point with the fact that they're telling her they're doing an investigation into the teacher's disappearance. They need permission to speak with her child, present her with a waiver, and she signs and gives that permission. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think especially the part about, oh, I didn't have my right glasses on. That always sounds a little like, okay, the dog ate my homework kind of deal. Jabor Randall, always great to have your insight. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, when we come back, folks, um, we're going to bring in our, our Sykes. We're going to talk about this type of behavior. Can you spot a teen who could potentially kill? Plus, coming up next hour. In Jacksonville, Florida, Chad Absher is accused of murdering his girlfriend and shooting his girlfriend's sister in the face. The sister survived and took the stand to face the man accused of shooting her. I, he pointed the gun at me. I didn't think he was going to shoot me, so I 
so I turned my head down. And as soon as I went to go turn, um, everything went black. It was a murder that sparked a manhunt. It's a horrific incident that happened. Chad Absher accused of killing his ex-girlfriend. But he's claiming self-defense. And now it's up to a jury. The controlling boyfriend murder trial. Weekday mornings on Court TV. A multi-millionaire facing a murder charge. David Youngerman, a wealthy businessman, is accused of killing lawyer Tom Picker. Now a jury will decide and you'll see it all on Court TV. The Millionaire Murder Trial. Coming soon. Only on Court TV. And was he otherwise a, a pretty good student? Yes. Okay. Did he have A's or B's in the rest of his classes? Pretty much. Okay, so Spanish was the one he was struggling with, is that right? Yes. So, Willard Chaden Miller, that was his mom. A's and B's mostly, which tells me he probably had a couple C's. Um, struggling in Spanish. Then, the Spanish teacher ends up beaten dead with a baseball bat. Check out what we found in some court documents. This is unbelievable. Investigators also discovered Miller had a meeting with Graber on the afternoon of November 2nd, 2021 to discuss his poor grade in Graber's Spanish class. The poor grade is believed to be the motive behind the murder of Graber, which directly connects Miller. Miller was interviewed by investigators and described the frustrations he had with the way Graber taught Spanish. Miller voices frustration over Graber hurting his grade. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm allergic to this ridiculous behavior I'm describing. Miller voiced his frustration over Graber hurting his grade point average and thought she was doing that to other students also. A murder motivated by a bad GPA from an AB sort of student? What's going on here? I need some experts. Joining me tonight in Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert, witness, and columnist of Inside the Criminal Mind, Dr. Carol Lieberman, and a New York City psychotherapist, host of Talking Live on Facebook Watch and the Bite Side podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig is with us. Uh, thank you both. Um, Dr. Carol, let me start with you. I've never, I don't know, GPA as a motive to take the life out of someone with a baseball bat in a murder that is alleged to have been planned and plotted, like they were stalking her to see where she hung out, when she was there, they knew when to pounce. Those are the allegations, presumed innocent. Um, your thoughts about the mind of a teenage boy who's so worried about his GPA that he would think murder is the solution? Yes, you know, you. this is very uh, abnormal, really. You know, most people who, most teenagers who are killing people are not worried about their GPAs. But, you know, I don't think it was just the grade. Um, he had this meeting with her, and uh, apparently she wasn't going to change his grade. Um, and I think it was perhaps more that he couldn't get his way. It seems like he wanted to get his way, particularly perhaps with a female figure, like you know, getting his way with his mother. Um, so I think that that was a big part of it. And um, you know, he gave this excuse. I don't know that this is going to be like the mother. What the mother was saying about they made me sign this and so on. I mean, it didn't really seem. It seemed like they could have done a better job of informing her. But at the same time, you know, there is so much that points to the guilt of him that I don't know in the end whether that's going to make a difference. Yeah, well, if you suppress all the evidence, that's the best chance you have, right? They don't get in any right. of the evidence. That's that's where right. they're going here because the evidence is very persuasive, his Snapchat communications. Yes. Yes. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, I want you to take a listen to some of the testimony that was objected to today. This is uh, one of the special agents talking about his interview with Chaden. <laughs> How would you describe the defendant's demeanor whenever he first came into contact with you? Um, remarkably relaxed. Um, given the circumstances that he was being woken up at his residence, uh, subject to a search warrant, and transported to 
um, a law enforcement location and then speaking with two detectives from the state police, um, he was remarkably relaxed and spent the better part of the first 20 minutes discussing his issues that he had uh, with Ms. Graber and- Your Honor. Big objection there, but Dr. Robbie, so your thoughts about the way he described uh, Chayden Miller, uh, who's being questioned about the murder of his Spanish teacher, remarkably calm, but expressing his frustrations with the woman who was beaten to death with a baseball bat. Well, I find it incredibly disturbing. Now, these kids are too young to be diagnosed with sociopathy. But what we do know is a person who has a conduct disorder or is on their way to uh, being diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, they don't respond in the same way that normal brains do or people who are not homicidal or dangerous. There's a tremendous amount of calm, there's no empathy, there's no remorse. And so they can feel calm under circumstances that most people can't. So I, I find this a disturbing signal that this person is uh, very dangerous. So this is a signal though, after a murder, an alleged yeah. murder. Dr. Mm -hmm. Carol Lieberman, can, is it possible to spot signs that a young teenager would be capable of killing? Is there a way, things yeah. that we should look for as red flags that, hey, okay, maybe some intervention here, maybe some professional help? Yes, absolutely. Um, for example, you know, even though technically you have to wait until age 18 approximately to diagnose a personality disorder, such as sociopathy, certainly there are signs that you can see leading up to that. For example, if there are other things that they do that are somewhat sociopathic, like cheating on tests or taking drugs or hanging out with a group of kids who, you know, are, are uh, have, a, have a record already, you know, who have been stealing things or um, doing criminal things uh, already, you can look at their social media and see warning signs there. Um, you know, it's so amazing, this trend of uh, teenagers doing crimes and boasting about it on social media. Now, okay, we're talking about before this crime. But yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to look for those signs before there is a victim. Yes. So, you know, of course there is um, the, th the triad, you know, bedwetting and, and setting fires and um, cruelty to animals. Perhaps he was showing some of those signs. Um, lack of empathy, you know, uh, um, really, he seems to have this this uh, this haughtiness, this this idea that he deserves an entitlement, a sense of entitlement. So that's part of it too. And how far is some team going to go to get what they think they're entitled to? Yeah, but you start talking about entitlement these days. I mean, I mean that's. You're talking about 85, 90 percent. Well, no, let's not get into that discussion tonight. <laughs> All right, Dr. Carol Lieberman, Dr. Robbie Ludwig staying with us. Uh